They're the ones who raise the bar. The ones dedicated to providing care in the most demanding of circumstances. The ones that understand the healing benefits of kindness and compassion. They're the people of Sarah Bush Lincoln, and they set the bar high. Sarah Bush Lincoln, trusted, compassionate care, right here, close to home. Carl is redefining healthcare around you, innovating new solutions and offering all levels of care when and where you need it. Investing in technology and research to optimize healthcare, Carl, with Health Alliance, is always at the forefront to help you thrive. Meeting the ever-changing healthcare needs of our communities, Paris Community Hospital Family Medical Center is now Horizon Health with the same ownership, management, providers, and employees. Horizon Health provides patient care and promotes wellness to the communities of East Central Illinois. At HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital, we are at work transforming heart care, rebuilding knees and hips, delivering new generations, and focused on providing health care to you. We are HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of Being Well. I'm your host, Kian Armstrong, and today we're going to be talking about gastroenterology. And joining me today is Dr. Kumar with HSHS Medical Group in Effingham. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, very important topic, something that uh, maybe people struggle with and, and don't want you know to let other people know, but there's answers out there and that's why we're here to tell them about it today. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me, what is a gastroenterologist? What do you do? A gastroenterologist takes care of diseases and symptoms of the gastrointestinal tract, which means the esophagus, stomach, colon, uh, the small intestine, and also the liver and the pancreas. Additionally, we have specific training in doing procedures like endoscopies and colonoscopies. Uh, becoming a gastroenterologist involves doing an internal medicine residency followed by three years of training in gastroenterology specifically mm -hmm. and at times an extra year of endoscopy training. Lots of training because there's lots involved in that area. Yes, that is true. Yeah, so um, folks who you mentioned in, in Endoscopy. I, I may yes. not get all of the names right. I'm going to try here. So is that how I say it? Endoscopy. Endoscopy. What is that exactly? Endoscopy is a camera examination of the esophagus, stomach, and the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. It's performed by a flexible fiber optic scope. Mm -hmm. And during the procedure, we can not only look, but we can also take biopsies, which are little bits of tissue that go to a pathologist to look at under a microscope. So if there's a, a disease that we can't see with our eyes, a pathologist may be able to tell us what's going on by looking at the tissue under a microscope. And we can dilate the esophagus if it's narrowed or cauterize bleeding areas if necessary. So the procedure is, is looking, but we can also do a, a lot of things inside. Okay, so what would lead somebody toward getting something like that done? Maybe some issues, um, symptoms that they're having What's some, why would you do that? An endoscopy can be useful to examine symptoms of the esophagus, like feeling that food is getting stuck on the way down, heartburn, reflux, pain, bleeding. It can be used to examine the stomach, upper abdominal pain, uh, suspicion of an ulcer, black tarry stool, and it can be done to biopsy the small intestine if we suspect celiac disease in which people can't, can't have gluten. Uh, so there are, there are many, many indications to have an endoscopy because it's a very flexible procedure. Okay, all right, and so the scope goes in your mouth and down? In the mouth, down the esophagus, stomach, and into the first part of the small intestine. Okay. And this is done usually under sedation so the patient is not aware of anything. So is it an outpatient procedure? They don't have to stay in the hospital for that? It's generally an outpatient procedure. Okay. All right, and so what about um, colonoscopy? Explain that. Colonoscopy is similar. A fiber optic exam through a flexible fiber optic scope. It's a video camera look at the entire colon and if we need to, the end of the small intestine from below. And similar to endoscopy, we can take biopsies, we can get pieces of tissue. 
The indications are somewhat different. It can be done for a change in bowel habits, but it can also be done to investigate symptoms like blood in the stool and uh, in some cases abdominal pain to check for diseases like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it can be done most importantly and most commonly for screening to check for colon cancer and to remove polyps before they can become colon cancer. Okay, and when should a person start getting colonoscopies? For screening for colon cancer, the societies vary on their recommendations. In general, age 50, mm -hmm. but the American Cancer Society recommends starting at age 45, and most societies recommend starting earlier if there's a family history, so 10 years younger than the most immediate relative who's had colon cancer or an advanced polyp. And in some cases, societies recommend uh, even earlier if there's a polyp syndrome as early as age 10. Hmm. And then of course, aside from all that, if there are symptoms that are concerning for colon cancer, like blood in the stool, weight loss that's unexplained, anemia or a low blood count, low iron, these things can warrant a colonoscopy as well. Okay. Your primary doctor can help you to examine your family history in detail because there are certain cases in which multiple relatives have had colon cancer, not necessarily just immediate relatives in which a colonoscopy is needed earlier. Okay, now is that the only screening for colon cancer is a colonoscopy? There are other methods for screening as well. You can have stool tests to check for blood or DNA that can suggest that you may have colon cancer or an advanced polyp. Uh, so there, there are a variety of tests for screening for colon cancer. However, there's a difference between screening and prevention. A lot of the stool tests or other alternative tests check you for colon cancer. A colonoscopy also checks you for colon cancer, but because we remove polyps, a colonoscopy, unlike everything else, actually prevents colon cancer from ever happening. In the United States, we take out about 10 million, 10 million or more precancerous polyps every year. In a decade, we've taken out over 100 million precancerous wow. polyps in the United States. That's amazing. That is amazing. And, and the result has been that colon cancer rates have declined by about half. Really? And they are continuing to decline steadily. And so colonoscopy is the only test uh, that checks for colon cancer, but also prevents colon cancer and that has significant benefits at the population level and also for individuals. Okay, now I'm coming from a layman's point of view here. Is colon cancer the same thing as colorectal in, cancer? In it's general, the same. yes. It's a, a, just different ways of saying it. Just different ways of saying it. Okay. Uh, the colon and rectum are continuous with each other. The rectum is the little bit at the end and uh, colorectal cancer is an umbrella term that covers all of, that, all of those areas. Okay. Now, is there a difference between a um, high-quality colonoscopy, general? Is, is it all the same thing, or is there differences? There are methods we can use to do a higher-quality colonoscopy. And high-quality colonoscopy is important because finding precancerous polyps that are hidden, sometimes small, sometimes difficult to see, is critical. Because left alone, if they're not removed, those polyps can grow, become more and more abnormal, and eventually become a cancer. So our goal is to find all the polyps and take them out during the colonoscopy. And in order to do that better, there are techniques like water exchange colonoscopy in which instead of putting in air or carbon dioxide on the way in, we put water in and suction out dirty water. This results in a cleaner colon. And if patients are having partial sedation or conscious sedation, it's a more comfortable exam. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, we use carbon dioxide instead of air when we insufflate because that results in less pain after the procedure. A slow withdrawal, carefully looking behind all the folds is critical because polyps can hide behind the folds that are facing away from us. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to take, take time in withdrawing the scope on the way back as we look for polyps and clean on the way in so that on the way back, we can focus on polyp detection and removal. Okay. And finally, we can look at certain areas of the colon twice and make sure that we didn't miss something. Yeah, very important to make sure you're looking for everything while you have the opportunity. Yes. Yeah. So is the preparation the same for both procedures for the patient? The preparation is different. For an endoscopy, patients usually just have to stop eating at midnight on the night before the procedure. For a colonoscopy, they usually have to have a clear liquid diet the day before the procedure and go through a bowel preparation. 
Now the bowel preparation is what most people are afraid of doing mm -hmm. or, or averse to doing and because of that people avoid having a colonoscopy. But our bowel preparations have improved dramatically in the last 10 or 20 years. It used to be a gallon of salty fluid that no one liked. It was hard to keep it down. Now we've gone to lower volumes of Gatorade and Miralax, which is tasteless. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there are prescription preparations available that are as little as two cups in size. So this has made getting a colonoscopy done much easier and much more pleasant. So there are a lot of options now for that. Right. Well, you hear a lot of people saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going through that. Yes. I've heard horror stories. So good news to come. It's not as bad as what it may have sounded in the That's past. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So I'm um, talking about in endoscopy in, um, up around this region. How does someone know, you know, maybe it's just heartburn, I don't, maybe it's just something I ate, um, not agreeing with me today. How do you know when there's a real problem and how to know when to go to the doctor? That can be challenging. Uh, a lot of patients have heartburn from time to time, especially with certain foods or large meals mm -hmm. or when lying down. And it can be difficult to decide when is that enough that it's a problem. And certainly if using a medication that's a proton pump inhibitor, like omeprazole, Nexium, Prevacid, Prilosec, Pantoprazole, Lensoprazole. If using a medication like that for four to eight weeks is not effective, that's a sign that a col an endoscopy is a good idea to check for esophageal cancer or Barrett's esophagus or other concerns that develop from acid reflux that causes heartburn. A lot of times acid reflux or reflux of bile or pancreatic enzymes can be occurring silently and we don't feel the burning. So. It's also a good idea to watch for other symptoms, difficulty in getting food down, or weight loss that's unexplained, a low blood count, throwing up blood, or having black tarry stool. It's a good idea if there are any worries to talk with a primary care doctor about whether an endoscopy is a good idea to see if there's something more going on, like an ulcer in the esophagus, inflammation of the esophagus, Barrett's esophagus, a stomach ulcer, all right, now what is Barrett's esophagus? I've never heard that term before. Barrett's esophagus is perhaps the link between heartburn and esophageal cancer. Esophageal cancer is usually found at a later stage. It's usually found at a stage where the optimal treatment that we would like to do is no longer an option. Mm -hmm. And Barrett's esophagus is a change in the surface of the lower esophagus, the part of the esophagus that is most exposed to stomach acid, bile, pancreas enzymes. And we think that perhaps stomach acid exposure in the lower esophagus causes the esophagus to change. And that change leads to a higher risk of esophageal cancer. We think that's where most lower esophageal cancer comes from. Hmm. And that change if found should be monitored because the risk of cancer of the esophagus is somewhere between one in 100 to one in 500 per year that will convert from Barrett's esophagus to esophagus cancer. In the, in the meantime, before that change happens, we hope that we can find dysplasia in the Barrett's esophagus. We monitor for dysplasia with biopsies every year or every few years. And if we find dysplasia, then we take action to prevent it from becoming cancer. Okay, and when you say dysplasia, explain that to folks. Dysplasia is a term that pathologists use when they're looking at the tissue under a microscope, and it's a change that is halfway to cancer. So when they find dysplasia, they grade it as a low-grade dysplasia or a high-grade dysplasia, and depending on what they find, we determine what we need to do, whether it's closer monitoring or sending them to get their Barrett's esophagus ablated Sometimes, in rare cases, severe cases, we have part of the esophagus removed, especially if there's an early cancer that we can't remove with other means, uh, in order to prevent an esophageal cancer that spreads. Hmm. Okay. Now, if you were to remove part of the esophagus, how does that, can a person still function by eating food and swallowing, and does it affect um, a person's daily living? In general, it does have a big effect on, on a person's daily living, and every case is different. Uh, but in general, a surgical removal of part of the esophagus results in dramatic change in quality of life. So we try to prevent that by finding Barrett's esophagus early, and once we found Barrett's esophagus, by finding dysplasia early, so that that never needs to be done. Okay. We want to avoid that surgery. Right, sounds like that. 
Um, you mentioned earlier celiac disease and um, folks who can't eat gluten. Yes. And we've talked about heartburn and acid reflux. Is it all dependent on what we eat and what goes in our body and how our body reacts to that? And uh, talk about celiac disease in that fold, if you would. Sure. So heartburn and reflux are not terribly dependent on diet. A lot of times heartburn and reflux, reflux being upward movement of stomach contents into the esophagus is due to a hiatal hernia in which the stomach has slipped upwards partially above the diaphragm and part of the stomach is now in the chest. When there is a hiatal hernia like that, the diaphragm is no longer pinching the junction of the esophagus and the stomach. In other cases, the esophagus is not functioning well and we all have some degree of reflux and the esophagus clears it, but if the esophagus doesn't do that, then we may notice more heartburn. Diet can affect these things by increasing the symptoms. It may, if you have a large meal and the large meal doesn't leave the stomach very well, result in prolonged heartburn. If you have a meal right before eating and you lie flat, the lack of gravity will allow food and liquid to move up your esophagus. So in some sense, a diet can make an impact on heartburn and reflux, large meals, eating right before bedtime. Um, but in other ways, uh, people with heartburn and reflux have a physical defect that diet will not, will not necessarily affect. Okay, but diet does affect celiac disease. Yes, diet greatly affects celiac disease. Celiac disease is a disease in which the immune system attacks the gastrointestinal tract. It does that after it's exposed to gluten in our diet. And so gluten intake can result in subsequent and prolonged attack by the immune system on the body long after the gluten has passed through. So in a patient diagnosed with celiac disease, a gluten-free diet is essential. And by gluten-free, we mean really gluten-free. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a patient who was sharing a toaster with her husband. She was having gluten-free bread, but just the exposure of her bread to the toaster where her husband was having normal bread resulted in visible damage on biopsies of her small intestine. Really? So the only treatment for celiac disease huh. is a strictly gluten-free diet forever, at least for now. And we can monitor the results on biopsies and we can see the improvement in the intestine when, when the patient enacts a gluten-free diet in celiac disease. Okay. Talk to me about irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome is uh, an issue of function rather than structure. There is no structural abnormality in the intestine, but there is a functional abnormality, and that results in symptoms. A syndrome is a collection of symptoms rather than specifically a disease on its own. In diagnosing irritable bowel syndrome, we have to eliminate other possibilities. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, there are also criteria, Rome criteria, which need to be met but we have to eliminate bacterial overgrowth, celiac disease, and other diseases which may be causing these symptoms before we can confidently say that someone has irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. And once we make a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, then our goal is to control the symptoms of the disease as best we can. So and is syndrome and disease two different things when it comes to irritable bowel? Yes, so there, uh, there is a an irritable bowel syndrome, which is a group of symptoms, and, um, and our goal is to eliminate diseases, which may be tricking us into thinking that a patient has irritable bowel syndrome when in fact they may actually have a disease like celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. It sounds like it could be complicated trying to figure out exactly what may be going on within a person's body. Is it take uh, a number of tests, um, a, a long time, is it a short time sometimes? Talk to me about the time frame on trying to figure out exactly what's going on with a person's body. Yes, so the diagnostic process varies. It varies based on a patient's risk factors, their general health, sometimes the, their age, and in some cases a diagnosis is easier to make and in other cases because we're concerned and our pretest probability is high we are more concerned about diseases other than irritable bowel syndrome. So the diagnostic process varies tremendously, but in general, it does require a good number of tests to confidently exclude diseases like celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, 
small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which may make us think that someone has irritable bowel syndrome when in fact they have something we can treat and in some cases cure. Okay. Now is irritable irritable bowel treatable or curable or both? Irritable bowel syndrome is treatable okay. chronically. Uh, if there is an underlying disease process like bacterial overgrowth, mm -hmm. then bacterial overgrowth can be cured and perhaps the symptoms that we were attributing to suspected irritable bowel syndrome will vanish. Okay, good to know because there's ways that you, you can help people's lives because it really does, you know, it takes over sometimes it a can. person's life and makes them miserable. Yes, irritable bowel syndrome can be associated with significant distress, mm -hmm. significant interference with daily activities, and so successful treatment of irritable bowel syndrome is usually life-changing for people. Absolutely. Now, I've heard a term called diverticulosis. What is that? Yes, diverticulosis is the formation of diverticula in the colon. Diverticula are divots in the colon that form over time. About half of people have them by age 50, about 80% of people have them by age 80. We think that this has something to do with diet. Perhaps it's low fiber, although that's controversial right now. And as these diverticula form, there is risk for two things. One is bleeding. As the diverticula get deeper, they may erode into a blood vessel, resulting in painless large volume bleeding that should be attended to in the emergency room to see if IV fluids are necessary, blood transfusion is necessary. It may be uh, necessary to rule out a cause for bleeding as soon as possible, like a growth or a tumor. Okay. But in general, uh, the bleeding does not recur and is self-limited. Diverticulitis is an infection of a diverticula and that occurs when the diverticula becomes impacted. Sometimes there can be a microperforation or a perforation of the colon in that area in which a hole forms in the diverticulum and stool contents go into the abdomen and the patient can get an abscess. And in those cases, antibiotics are necessary. Usually with diverticulitis, we do a colonoscopy when the diverticulitis has quieted down to exclude the presence of a tumor or something else that needs to be attended to. Okay. We've got a couple of minutes left, and on my list here, I have something called gastroparesis. Yes. Explain that. Gastroparesis is a very common cause for nausea, especially in patients with diabetes. It's a result of the stomach not emptying properly, and when food stays in the stomach for an hour, two, three, four hours, frequently nausea results, sometimes heartburn and reflux as a result, and this can be treated with medication and uh, in rare cases interventions such as a venting tube, a venting feeding tube, sometimes surgery or placement of a stimulator is needed. Uh, but in patients with prolonged nausea it's worth checking for. Yeah, absolutely. Well like I said we have a couple of minutes left. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to get out to our viewers right now? One thing that we are doing as gastroenterologists is treating obesity mm -hmm. and weight management. And so there are a number of endoscopic options for weight management, including intragastric balloons, which are balloons that are placed in the stomach, take up space, and can result in significant weight loss while they're in place. Usually we work with those patients to implement diet and lifestyle monitoring so that they can maintain the weight loss long term. Additionally, there are feeding tubes which can be placed and then some of the food can be removed and the stomach can be sutured into a smaller size. So there are a number of emerging endoscopic options for weight management. Yeah, sounds like new treatments, different things to help people in lots of difficult situations. Yes. Well, we've gotten a lot of information out to our viewers today. I want to thank you so much for being a part thank of you. Being Well and taking the time to talk to our viewers today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you very much for tuning in for this episode. We hope that you have found it useful and very informative, and we'll see you next week. At HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital, we are at work transforming heart care, rebuilding knees and hips, delivering new generations, and focused on providing health care to you. We are HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital. Meeting the ever-changing health care needs of our communities, Paris Community Hospital Family Medical Center is now Horizon Health. 
with the same ownership, management, providers, and employees. Horizon Health provides patient care and promotes wellness to the communities of East Central Illinois. Carl is redefining healthcare around you, innovating new solutions and offering all levels of care when and where you need it. Investing in technology and research to optimize healthcare, Carl, with Health Alliance, is always at the forefront to help you thrive. They're the ones who raise the bar. The ones dedicated to providing care in the most demanding of circumstances. The ones that understand the healing benefits of kindness and compassion. They're the people of Sarah Bush Lincoln, and they set the bar high. Sarah Bush Lincoln, trusted, compassionate care, right here, close to home.